Hello, good evening to everyone, brothers and sisters around the GCC countries. And some are in the Philippines attending us tonight. Tonight, we are privileged again of having great brother in the Lord, a teacher in the church, Dr. John Oaks, who owns the website Evidence for Christianity. It will be our second session tonight with him. Turn with me in Colossians 3. Sixteen to eighteen, in the New Living Translation, let the message about Christ, in all its richness, fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom He gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say. Do it as representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to Him, to God the Father. Last night, we had a great time with Mortisa, with all the singles ministry all over GCC. And this is our second devotional of the week. Isn't it awesome, singles, that we are blessed so much of God's Word? in this church so i don't know about you but i'm excited to listen to to john oaks again tonight okay so before we proceed before i give you the, the the floor to to john oaks let's pray to god we praise you O god for this great night that we're able to listen to your word Fill Dr. John Oaks with your spirit. Open our mind and our hearts to fully understand the teachings about the book of Revelation. Bless our fellowship. I pray special prayer for Bien right now that he's still in ICU. We love him so much, Father, that I pray for, for, for complete healing for him. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to start the PowerPoint and welcome everybody. I very distinctly remember me meeting with the singles there in Dubai a few years ago and thinking that's one of the more dynamic singles groups really that I've been able to speak to. <coughs> I really appreciate the spirit there. Hope you're doing as well now as you were then. Anyway, uh, let me remind you of what we did last week. Uh, we gave the uh, we spent probably about uh, three quarters of the time doing kind of the introduction to the book of Revelation. Spent some time explaining what apocalyptic literature is about, giving some of the historical background uh, to John and Pergam and the the sit situation with with the uh, persecution. Uh, talked a little bit about uh, views of end times, uh, including ones that are almost certainly false. And then uh, we introduced the theme of Revelation. I want to re review that. So the theme of Revelation is this. Peel back the layers of history and even the terrible situation that the church is in right now, but by, by that what I mean in the 90s AD, and the Lamb is on the throne and God is in control. I said this last time. I'm going to say it again. Uh, the two chapters to sort of keep coming back to in the book of Revelation is chapter 4 and 5. Because there you see the Lamb and you see the Father on his throne. The message of Revelation is pretty simple. Although, you know, Revelation is one of the harder books to kind of delve into the details of. The message is really simple. Be encouraged and remain faithful to Jesus Christ to the end. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. It's a message that I think all of us need to remember in whatever situation we find ourselves. So the objective then is to specifically is to comfort Christians who are being heavily persecuted. Uh, Revelation has been described as a divine comic book or a divine uh, picture book, spiritual cartoons. Like I said, Romans appeals to the mind, Psalms to the heart, 
Revelation appeals to the imagination. All right, and then uh, we went into the um, first chapter, and we found out that that the majority of what we see here in the book of Revelation re is regards things that will soon take place. And what, so basically then this whole idea that most of Revelation is about current events or the near future, that's just simply not true. Does it have application to current times? Of course it does. But remember with apocalyptic literature, you wanna find out uh, what the setting is and, and then interpret it in light of that and then apply it to your situation, okay? And uh, we saw that the letter was written to the seven churches. In this case, remember I said with apocalyptic literature, generally we interpret everything in symbolically, unless we have a reason to turn, interpret it literally. In this case, there are literal, seven literal churches. We're going to find out about that in today's lesson. And then uh, the thing I, I kind of, the take home lesson for the whole of chapter one is that picture of Jesus. Remember I asked you, picture Jesus in your mind. Most of us picture maybe from a stained glass window, possibly, I don't know, picture of Jesus with some sheep or some children, and a gentle person, which that's a legitimate picture of Jesus. Uh, certainly uh, the gospels present a Jesus like that. But the picture in Revelation chapter one is of a powerful, all seeing, all knowing, even ready to judge Jesus. And that's the picture to hold in your mind throughout the book of Revelation, because again, this is the prologue. And so the first thing God wants to do is establish a picture. And that picture may not be <laughs> your standard picture of Jesus. Okay, got it? So that brings us to chapter two and three. Now to compare Revelation to one of Paul's letters, in Paul's letters, generally you have um, uh, theology for the first half or so, and then practical application, the second half. Well, Revelation is in a sense the opposite of that. We have the sort of practical application right at the beginning. And then we don't move from there into theology, we move into apocalyptic literature. So uh, the, the part of Revelation that's easy to understand generally, easy to preach, if you've heard a sermon from Revelation, it probably comes from Revelation two and three, most likely. All right, so I'm gonna spend some time here, but honestly, I don't need to spend as much time as I might because these are things mostly you could figure out for yourself. It's not hard to figure out. So anyway, we have seven letters. The reason we have seven letters is because we have seven churches. And remember, these seven churches probably are the ones that John himself felt personal responsibility for as a shepherd, as an elder, as an elder in Ephesus. So the pattern of the letters is this. It starts with a greeting and then a description of Jesus because they're trying to set the stage. Jesus is here. He's present. And generally, the description of Jesus will use some aspect of the vision of Jesus we had back in chapter one. And then there will be a commendation. You are doing really well in this area, except for Sardis and Laodicea, sorry, no praise. And then a criticism, something they need to change or repent of, except Smyrna and Philadelphia, which have no criticism. And then a warning, and then a promise, okay? So that's a pattern of God communicating with the churches, communicating with us, uh, possibly even um, a pattern for a sermon. I don't know. All right, so let's get to uh, Revelation 2. Uh, the, the two most famous letters are the ones to Ephesus and Laodicea, probably, as far as what people tend to preach. So let me read the letter to the church in Ephesus. The, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them to be false. You have per persevered, have endured hardship for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You've forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. 
Repent, do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you. I'll remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Galatians, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the one who's victorious, I'll give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So if we go back to that pattern, greeting, description of Jesus, commendation, criticism, and then one extra little commendation at the end he slips in, and then an appeal and warning and a promise. Okay, got it? So he says here, Jesus has the seven stars in his hand. And earlier in chapter one, he says the seven stars are the seven churches. So we got the idea of Jesus holding the churches in his hand. Jesus is present among the, ch the churches. He knows what's going on. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. We're not left as orphans. Despite all the appearances, and some of the churches are going through some pretty tough struggles right now with special persecution. Despite all appearances, Jesus is caring for the churches like a bird cares for her chicks, like Jesus said in, in Matthew, I believe it's 23. It says, and Jesus is walking among the golden lampstands, the churches. He knows what's going on. He's paying attention. And I don't know if you have the sense that Jesus is watching over the church in Dubai and Kuwait City and, and all the other cities in the, in the Gulf. So what comes to mind? Do you, are you aware of Jesus' presence in the church in your daily life? Do you think about that? Jesus knows what's going on. Nothing misses his attention. And I think if we understood that, it might affect the way we act, the way we worship the way we come together. Some of us have done a few pretty embarrassing things in terms of fighting over foolish things. I do think if we understood that Jesus was walking among the churches in Oman and, and in Qatar and all these cities, I think that that would help us. Remember, um, Ephesus, it plays a pretty big role in the New Testament. It's the place where that, uh, you know, the, the long live Artemis of the Ephesians, the, the, the riot that happened in Ephesus. Ephesus was one of the leading churches in the entire New Testament church. So anyway, so he's walking among the churches. And um, so then they get some praise and they're praised for their hard work, for their perseverance and for their staunch opposition to sin. If you ask the members of the church in Ephesus, how's it going? They would say, we're doing great. We're working hard. We're sharing our faith. You know, we're, we're, we're hanging in there. We're continuing to teach correct doctrine. They, they think they're doing great. And we got to remember that. They think they're doing great. Are they doing great? They're not doing great, folks. They're in danger of losing their salvation or or their role as a church. He talks about the Nicolaitans here. The Nicolaitans, we're, we're not sure, scholars aren't sure who those are. There's a theory, there's a guy of Nic named Nicholas of Antioch who was a Jewish proselyte in Acts 6-5. I mean, that's just people, just basically somebody named Nicholas, so they're just thinking it might be him. Uh, scholars suggest that this Nicholas of Antioch was encouraging pagan, uh, traditions and practices in the church. Anyway, here's the problem. Despite their hard work, despite the perseverance, despite their uh, commitment to sound doctrine, to oppose false teaching, they've lost their first love. Now, this is surprising because you would think if you lost your first love, you would grow weary, that you wouldn't be working hard. You wouldn't be persevering. It, it's, it's a little bit surprising. They've lost their first love, and yet they're continuing to be committed. This is a little bit of, of a surprise. How would you describe these disciples? I think what they are is they're, they have a strong Christian habit. And by the way, just so you know, that's a good thing. They are being praised for that. 
They had been doing the right thing for so long, they were pretty good at it. And they were continuing to do the right thing. What have they lost, though? They'd lost the most important thing. We have to remember that. We can do so many good things, and God's praising us for that. But if we lose our love for God, those things just don't matter so much. They're a little bit like the audience of Hebrews. And Hebrews, these are disciples who've been in the, in the faith for a long time. They've done great things. In Hebrews 10, he commends them for their perseverance. And yet, also, the church in Hebrews is in a situation where they're attempting to turn back. So what's his solution? In verse 5, he gives the solution. And, you know, can, a good question to ask right now, can you relate on some level to this? All right, the churches have been there. I don't know how long the church in Dubai has been present, but I'm going to guess over 20 years, maybe close to 25. Some of the other churches for 20 years. And I, I, the church is, you know, by the way, just so you know, in the U.S., our churches, our sister churches there in the in Middle East get a lot of praise. And for good reason. You guys have set a great example. And by the way, it's just, you know, I'm not accusing you of losing your first love. I'm not doing that at all. Not even close. But it's, a t it's just a time to ask that question. I'm, I'm not here to judge or anything like that. Far from it. So he says, consider how far, here's the solution. Consider from where you've fallen, number one. Take stock of where you're at. Number two, repent and do the things you did at first. Now, that's confusing to me. Okay, it says, do the things you did at first, but they're already doing the things they did at first, right? They're working hard, they're persevering, and they're opposing false doctrine. But when he says this, it is a little bit confusing to me. What does he mean when he says, do the things you did at first? I think what he means is, do it the way you did it at first. Remember that zeal. Remember that motivation. And the Christian life is a little bit like a marriage. All, almost all marriages, uh, marriages that are based on love, which is the standard in America. I, I know there are arranged marriages in India, but in, in America, uh, marriage starts out with, uh, you know, zeal, excitement. Everything's new. Everything's amazing. My husband never has bad breath, uh, you know, whatever. And, and that first phase always ends. And that's true in Christianity as well, right? In Christianity as well, that sort of uh, falling in love situation, all of us pass through that. So the kind of love in a healthy long-term marriage is not the same as that sort of, you know, childlike or childish kind of love, all right? But the thing is, we need to make that transition from that youthful zeal, which but that doesn't continue to a more mature being in love with God. So it says, do it the way you did it at first. Not do what you did, but do it the way you did it. All right? They shared their faith zealously. <clears throat> uh, last week, my wife and I and some friends, you know what we did? We went out and shared our faith. <laughs> we went to a park and we brought invitation cards and we were sharing with people I had done that for a while partly because of covid you know what it was fun i enjoyed it we had some great conversations we get out of the habit of doing some of these things zealously and and uh, also our fellowship get back to the kind of fellowship where we're just hanging out together and just loving being together not thinking about you know work tomorrow or or the soccer game whether our team is doing okay in the olympics or something like that what's at stake you know what what's at stake is everything if we don't maintain our love for god we could lose our salvation he says if you don't repent i'm going to come and remove your lampstand now, if he removes the lampstand, that doesn't mean everybody in the church goes to hell. Because, you know, there's a sense in the Bible in which we're saved as a group. 
And there's a different sense in which we're saved individually. Both are true. Got that? The Holy Spirit dwells in us individually and the Holy Spirit dwells in us corporately. They're both true. So I believe if he were to take away the lampstand, that would mean for all practical purposes, the church in Ephesus would cease to exist. I believe some of the members would still make it to heaven. All right. So we need to repent. Then he mentions the Nicolaitans briefly. Um, uh, the Nicolaitans, prob uh, again, they're probably practicing some kind of, of encouraging um, idolatry in the churches. Okay. So he says, I'll remove your lampstand. All right. But then he says, whoever hears, let, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who's victorious, I will give the right to eat the tree of life. And by the way, we're going to see that tree of life in Revelation uh, chapter 22. All right, next is Smyrna. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I forgot to advance my slides. Let's just super, super quickly review what we had in Ephesus, their hard work, their perseverance, opposition. We, we had lost our first love. We said yes. Remember, uh, this is the church that John was uh, responsible for. They lost their first love. Their solution is to remember and then repent. Do it the way they did it first. Okay, the church in Smyrna. Every time we go to another church, I'm going to go back to a map because we're going to see this is a circuit. Good old-fashioned evangelistic circuit back in the days. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. So here's a, uh, uh, a, a picture from the actual ruins in the, of the of of um, Smyrna. Let's read the admonition to Smyrna. It says to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write, these are the words of him who was the first and the last who died and came to life again. Again, he just starts with a greeting, and then a description of Jesus based on chapter one. Who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions, your, your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they're Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you'll suffer persecution for 10 days. Uh, be faithful even to the point of death, and will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who's victorious will not be, uh, be hurt by, at all by the second death. Now, remember I said there are two churches who receive only commendation no criticism or warning. And one of those is Smyrna. Of the seven churches, Smyrna's probably one of the smaller ones. <clears throat> All right. And why does Jesus only have good things to say uh, about Smyrna? Is it because there are no problems in the church? No, I'm sure there's problems in the church. As with any church, there are probably individuals who are caught up in sin. There's probably things going on, but because of the ex extreme persecution they're undergoing, they're under a lot of pressure. And right now, what they need is just encouragement. You know, there's times when the church flat out just needs encouragement. No matter what else is going on, they just need encouragement. And Smyrna is one of those churches. All right, the synagogue of Satan is there. And he's talking about the Jewish synagogue. Remember, most of the cities that, that Paul went to, he'd first go to the synagogue, try to convert the Jews there, and then he'd go to the, to the, to the Greeks. Uh, and by the way, above, the, on the uh, frontispiece above the door to ancient synagogues, it would say, uh, it would say um, the synagogue of Jehovah the synagogue of the Lord. So he's saying, they ain't the synagogue of Jehovah, they're the synagogue of Satan. That's really, really strong words. All right, so much for the idea that God has a special place. A lot of people say that, you know, based on Romans chapter 13 or 14, that God sort of has a special, you know, role for the Jews in the last time. 
But I, I believe that that special time ended in 70 AD and that the Jews are like anybody else, that they, they just need to become a Christian. All right. So, it's, so the church is poor. The church is made out of mostly poor people. But he says you are rich. And we need to remember that no matter what our, our physical situation of poverty is, if we have a relationship with God, we are rich. Do you feel rich? Do you feel blessed because of your relationship with God? Or do you feel poor? In 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10, it says, if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Then he says that there's a persecution coming. Remember, the persecution under Domitian is coming, but that, that's, that's Roman persecution. He's In this case, he's not talking about a Roman persecution. He's probably talking about persecution from the Jews in that city. Says it's going to last for 10 days. So what's that mean? Does that mean literally 10 days? Probably not. I guess it doesn't really matter since we're that not that church doesn't really matter. But remember, 10 means uh, a complete time. So it's going to last for a certain length of time. Probably not literally 10 days. I guess it doesn't really matter. How faithful does Jesus want them to be? Look at this. This is pretty a, a pretty in, intense here. He says, be faithful even to the point of death. You know, the worst thing they can do to you is they can take your life. And I know of at least one story of, of a, I believe it was a, a, a sister in Yemen who literally gave her life. Is that not true? And I wouldn't be a bit surprised if there were other stories in the Middle East of people who loved and were committed to the point of death. I think we disciples here in America are soft. We're soft in our faith. But I believe on average, you guys are stronger in that way because the ever presence, the ever continuing presence of persecution is something you guys deal with. I believe that keeps you stronger. And hopefully you, you don't necessarily completely uh, reject, you know, like terrible thing that you have persecution because persecution is what keeps the church pure in many ways. So how faithful do we need to be? We need to be faithful to the point that we would literally die and not deny Jesus. Okay. And if we do that, God says we will receive a crown and the second death will have no impact on us. We'll get a free pass into eternal kingdoms. Okay, got it? it? Says, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now let's go to Pergamum. Pergamum. By the way, that's me. If you go to Berlin, there's the Pergamum Museum. And the, the entire central market of the ancient city of Pergamum. And they moved it to Berlin. It's, a, it's an amazing museum. I don't know about the people in Turkey. How, all right, so now we're in Pergamum. Pergamum was the largest city in the province of Asia. It used to be the capital of essentially Greek Rome, Greek, Greek part of the Roman Empire. Uh, that It's lost that. Um, distinction to Ephesus. Pergamum was a large, uh, ancient, and wealthy city. It also had the greatest library in the ancient world other than the one in Alexandria. You've probably heard of the, the famous library in Alexandria. I'm guessing most of you have, uh, Alexandria in Egypt. But before that, outside of Alexandria, Pergamum was a great center of learning of universities and a huge library. But another thing they have in Pergamum, it's, he calls it the throne of Satan. How would you like to live in a city whose nickname is the throne of Satan? Ouch, that's an intimidating place. That's one intimidating place. Let me read the admonition to Pergamum. To the angel of the church of Pergamum, write, These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. I don't know if you feel that way about the city you live in, maybe, don't know. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith to me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness. 
Apparently, they too had lost somebody who had been murdered because of his faith, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. That's not the first time we've seen the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I'll soon come to you. I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who's victorious. I'll give some of the hidden manna. I'll also give the person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Uh, the letter to Pergamum is, is, is really kind of an interesting one. There's interesting stuff there. Like I said, the largest city in Asia at the time, the, uh, the, the capital of Roman power, former capital, and also it's kind of the, the greatest seat of paganism in all of Ionia, which is the region of Western Turkey and the islands off the coast there. And it's where the throne of Satan is. By the way, that's almost certainly a reference to the Temple of Zeus in the picture. On the right hand side of the screen, on top of that hill, you can see this massive, massive temple of Zeus, which is probably what he's referring to when he says the, the throat of Satan. Also, I mentioned the Pergamum Library. Okay. Uh, the library in Pergamum was the second largest in the room with 200,000 volumes. Uh, when they tried to get a librarian of Alexander to come to Pergamum, the Ptolemies cut off the supply of papyrus from Egypt, which is why ultimately Alexander won out as the greatest library in the ancient world. So we have here Jesus, the one with the sharp double-edged sword. Watch out. Antipas, my faithful witness, and the word witness here is martyrus, from which we get the word martyr. Now, the problem there is that some hold to the teaching of Balaam. Uh, you probably know about Balaam. He's the guy with the donkey that talked to him, right? And Balaam, he was a, a prophet, and he did prophesy the words from God, but he also tempted the Jews to take part in pagan forms of worship. So that's what's going on here. So in the church in Pergamum, we have disciples who are encouraging Christians to take part in some ways in the local pagan worship. All right. The problem in Pergamum is a lack of discipline, a lack of church discipline. I know you've had some church discipline issues there, especially in Dubai. I've, I've kind of been aware of some of those. And, and those were tough times. I know the church had to take some tough stands against some divisive people. I'm aware of that. All right. And I just want to commend you for that. All right. That you're willing to do the tough things. This, and, you know, it's, it's extremely, extremely painful to apply church discipline. And hopefully we do it very, very rarely. But unfortunately in Pergamum, they had some people doing some stuff that was just simply not acceptable in a Christian church. And they were tolerating it. They were tolerating it. And, and is, here's a good question. Is tolerance a Christian virtue? And I, I, in the Middle East, not so much, but in America, tolerance is almost like a, a religion. And I believe uh, tolerance is, uh, it's, it's kind of a mixed answer to that question. All right, we don't tolerate sin, okay? We tolerate one another, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> but we don't tolerate sin. All right. So. And Jesus here, he expresses some anger, right? Repent, therefore, otherwise I'll soon come to you. I will fight against you with the sword of my mouth. But then there's some, but he ends with some really awesome um, encouragement there. Some awesome encouragement. God expects the church to discipline these teachers. Why does he just deal with them directly? Because 
That's the way he set it up. We need to have discipline in the churches. Then he says, but to those who overcome, I have hidden manna. He says, I'm going to meet your spiritual needs. And then there's this white stone. Uh, the white stone was used when they would have a, a, a court proceedings uh, in the Greek world. Uh, the jurors would be given a black stone and a white stone. And what they would do is they would take a stone and put it into the sack, and then they would count the stones. And the white stone is the symbol for acquittal. In other words, you are found holy and righteous. It was also given to freed slaves. When a slave was freed, they were given a white stone with a seal on it from the owner, which is a token of them having been set free. And man, that's pretty, that's pretty encouraging. All right. Pergamum, reassurance, hidden manna, white stone, symbol of acquittal. All right, next is Thyatira. How am I doing here? Okay. Thyatira. To the angel of the church of Thyatira, write, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like a blazing fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. Again, that's a picture from back in chapter one, correct? That bronze represents strength. And by the way, Thyatira had an active bronze ministry. Uh, bronze industry, excuse me. Nevertheless, I said, I, I, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, and your service, and your perseverance. That's some pretty awesome stuff. And that you are now doing more than you did at first. Unlike Ephesus, this church is not only persevering, they're growing. They're, they're, they have a great reputation. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual morality, the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I've given her time to repent of her morality, but she's unwilling, so I'll cast her on a bed of suffering. I'll make, her, make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely until they repent of her ways. I'll strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, you who do not hold to her teachings and so have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. So here there's not a threat to take away the, 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 the lampstand. All right. So the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. Uh, that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I've received authority from my father, I'll also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thyatira. Thyatira was kind of like a blue-collar city. I don't know if that word blue-collar means anything to you all. Uh, a working city with lots of industry, busy city, trades, trades in purple cloth, dyeing purple cloth and also specifically working in bronze. They had trade unions. And in the Greek world, Greek and Roman world, if you were in a trade union, it was absolutely required that you offer pagan sacrifice. So bottom line is Christians had to decide either to be unfaithful and to offer pagan sacrifice or to basically not have work. Uh, the, the, the majority of the good paying work in Thyatira required you not be faithful to Jesus. That's a tough thing. So what was Jezebel telling them to do? She tells them, no big deal. No big deal. God would understand. You know, he knows you need to, to feed your family. He, you know, a little compromise of your Christian conviction. God understands that. So, you know, offer the sacrifice. Don't, don't give them your heart. Just, just sort of go through the motions. I mean, it's just, you know, these, these idols aren't gods anyway. They're nothing. And even Paul said, you know, you can eat meat sacrificed to idols, so why not just sacrifice to the idols? That's what Jezebel was saying. Ouch. All right. So they're, they're commended. They're commended because of their giving and serving heart and attitude and the church is even growing 
All right, Jesus has eyes like a blazing fire, feet like burnished bronze. They're giving, they're serving, they're growing. This church is doing well. They're, they're not in as bad a shape as Ephesus, not in as bad a shape as Pergamum, but nevertheless, the seed has been planted. All right, they, because the seed has only been planted and not really given a lot of fruit, the church is still in pretty good condition. So, but he basically saying is, look, if you allow this seed to grow, you will get in as bad a situation as Pergamum is today. The, the seeds of spiritual disaster has been planted. And so especially the shepherds in the church, I speak especially to the shepherds in the church. We need to watch for these seeds. And when they start sprouting, we need to pull them up. We need to do it lovingly and patiently, but we need to pull them up. So they're tolerating Jezebel. Probably, scholars agree, probably this is an actual person. Her name is most likely not Jezebel. Uh, Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, he's using that kind of, you know, he, he's not calling her out by name. But i put it this way. If you lived in Thyatira, you, you're sitting there in that meeting, and he says Jezebel, and everybody's looking at this one woman. They know exactly this is. Her sin was encouraging participation in idolatry in order to keep your job. Her sin was saying, it's okay to miss church if you have a job. It's okay. It's okay to have a job that requires you to lie or to, to, uh, to, to commit uh, some sort of, of um, you know, dishonest dealings or some corruption because that's the way of the world. It's okay to take a job as a policeman, even though that requires you to do X, Y, or Z. And he says that, that these people have committed adultery with her and she has children. So she has a following in the church. See, that's the problem. When people like this pop up in the church, they, they take, get a following. And what happens is when you finally call them out, the people that have sort of followed them tend to leave the church with them. If only these people would just leave the church by themselves, but they don't do it. So this is a warning against divisiveness. Okay, got it? All right, and God says, I've given her time to repent, and I'm going to deal with her. It's interesting. In Pergamum, he tells them to deal with the problem. It's interesting. And Thyatira says, I'm going to take out Jezebel. I don't know how God took her out. I really don't know. I don't know. How. All right. Anyway, he says, hold on to the end. And he's saying to us, we will have authority over nations. Thyatira. All right, now, again, here's that picture. We're, we're on church number four. We're, we're almost completing our circuit. I need to finish in the next 10 minutes, I think, so we could take some questions here. Uh-oh, am I going to finish? Uh, uh, we'll see. So we're now in Sardis. All right. Sardis, you can see it's on the, there's a picture. It's on top of a mountain. Sardis was a city on the top of a very high hill. It was very protective. And the, pe the people in Sardis thought, we're, we're awesome. We're a powerful, we're an ancient kingdom. They were the ancient capital of Lydia and Croesus, who was the, it was the king, the fabled Croesus, the richest man in the world. You know, Croesus was famous because he went to the oracles of Delphi. Uh, this Herodotus records this. He went to the oracles of Delphi to see, because he was going to have a, a, a war coming on with uh, the king of Persia. And the, the, he said, should I attack King Cyrus? And the oracle said, sure, if you do, a great nation will fall. Well, guess what? It was true. And he lost his kingdom. That's 549 BC. Sardis is on the side of a very, very steep hill. So steep, its own citizens thought it was impregnable. Now, Jesus is going to play off on this in his uh, talking to the city of Sardis. But it was conquered by Cyrus, and later on it was conquered again by Antiochus III in 218 BC. So basically it was a city that had great reputation, but it didn't live up to its reputation. It was also known for robbers who would come there and hide out from the authorities on the hill. Good. 
to the angel of the church of Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a re reputation for being alive, but you're dead. Got that? A reputation for being alive, but are dead, which really describes the whole history of the city of Sardis. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I found your deeds unfinished in the sight of God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come. So unlike um, Thyatira, who he's not threatening to take away their candlestick. Here he's threatening to remove them as a church. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their clothes. They'll walk with me dressed in white, for they're worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of the person from the book of life. I will acknowledge their name before the Father and his angels. Whoever has ears to hear, let the Spirit hear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So it's the capital of Lydia, the King Croesus, on a steep mountain. Nevertheless, it had been conquered. It has a great reputation and never seems to live up to its reputation. A history of overconfidence. Similarly for the church, great reputation. I don't know if this applies to any church there. I really have no idea, honestly. So their problem wasn't just wasn't unlike Thyatira and Pergamum that had the seeds of sin planted in the church. Their problem was relying on their awesomeness and thinking there's something great rather than relying on God. She says, wake up, like in Hebrews uh, 2, verse 1. Remember, obey, and repent. Okay? Uh, there's no encouragement to Sardis. They're so prideful. He has nothing good to say to them. He, well, he says, okay, there's a few faithful disciples in your church. Even in a dead church, some will be alive. All right, some of us have been in that kind of situation in the church. I remember how um, Elijah felt that way. I'm the only one left, all right? But anyway, God says, if you stay faithful, even in an unfaithful church, you will make it. All right, I don't, I don't have a lot of time for Sardis. I have to get on to Philadelphia, and I want to at least introduce Laodicea. Let's read about Philadelphia. Do the angel, by the way, Philadelphia is one of the two churches that is only praise. These are the words of him who is holy and true, holds the key of David. Who opens the, what he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. I have placed before you an open door so that no one can shut it. I know you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Maybe there's a church somewhere there in the in the Gulf region that's kind of small. People don't know a lot about it, but you know what? They're just faithful to Jesus. Maybe there's a church like that there. All right, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I'll make them come down and fall at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you since you have kept my command to endure patiently. I'll also keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole earth. See, there's persecution, and God's going to keep, you know, normally God doesn't do this, but in this case he says, I'm going to keep the persecution away from your city. You are an awesome church. All right, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who's victorious, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I'll write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven for my God. I will write on them my new name. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. And by the way, there's some interesting details about the city of Philadelphia that match perfectly kind of the description here. There was a large Jewish population, like there had been in um, Smyrna. The, the synagogue of Satan essentially is there. It says Jesus holds the keys to, the, to David's house. All right. Uh, a reference to Isaiah 22, 21 through 22. It says you're small and weak, but you're doing great. He says you guys are the true Jews. These other Jews are false Jews. They're claiming the J Jewishness, but they're really not. In, in Galatians 3.29, it says, we are the true sons of Abraham. 
And same thing in Romans 9, 6 through 9. We are the true, the real Israel. We who are disciples of Jesus. He says, he says, these Jews who are persecuting you, I'm going to make them come and worship at your feet. I think this is a promise that some of these prideful American Jews are going to be converted and become part of the church there. That's really encouraging. And you're not going to experience the worst of the persecution. No, I'm going to come take care of you. It says, I'm going to make you a pillar. By the way, uh, the church in Philadelphia was famous for its pillars. They had really awesome pillars. All right, and he says, I'm never, you're never going to have to flee the city. The reason he says this is there had been a, a very large earthquake which had destroyed the city of Philadelphia just a few years before. And everybody had gone running out of the city, and many of the pillars fell down. So he's, he's using that historical reference to say, you are the pillar, and you'll never, ever have to flee from the city. And he says, I'm going to give you a new name, which is interesting because Philadelphia literally had just been given a new name, which is Neo Caesarea, when Tyrus helped to rebuild the city. So again, sometimes our churches just need persecution. All right, I, I want to finish the seven churches, all right? So give me about five more minutes here. Laodicea, a huge city. Look at that picture of Laodicea. That, that main street is something like a mile long. The ruins of Laodicea are really fairly complete. Also look at the map. We are now finishing our seven city circuit. And remember, this, these are cities that the Apostle John is responsible for. John's feeling a little bit of heat, especially about the church in Laodicea. All right, Laodicea, a center of banking, of the a black wool industry, and also with a very, very famous school of medicine, which was famous for the eye salve that it made. All right, and so God is gonna use all these facts about the city of Laodicea in his admonition. All right, Laodicea is the second church for which there is no praise at all. Laodicea is doing terrible. This is not good. Okay, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds. You're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I've acquired wealth and I don't need a thing. This church was made up out of largely rich members. Unfortunately, they were relying on their wealth. All right, but you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in the fire so that you can become really rich, spiritually rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and sad. Remember that eye salve they made there to put on your eyes so you can really see. Those who I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me in my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. And by the way, in the next chapter, we're going to see the father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Wouldn't it be better to be lukewarm than cold? Wouldn't that be better? The answer is no, it's not. By the way, um, scholars argue over this. Some scholars say hot and cold are both good and lukewarm is bad. Others say hot is good, cold means you know no lo not loving God at all. And so I, I, I don't care. I don't care about that scholarly debate. I'm gonna go with the old-fashioned boring version, which is Cold means cold to God, hot means hot for God, and lukewarm means lukewarm for God. I'm going to go with the old-fashioned, uh, you know, the scholars may scoff at that. I don't care. The bottom line is, if you're lukewarm, you make God sick. Uh, that, that's, that's a tough message. That is a tough message. I'm telling you, there's a lot of lukewarm Christianity out there. 
I'm not sure if it's the same in the Middle East. Probably not. I'm guessing the percentage of lukewarm people who call themselves Christians is probably a little bit lower there than it is here, just because of the situation. But I'm sure you deal with it. You know, people that uh, go to church on Sunday, praise the Lord, hallelujah, they go home, and then they just live the life just like anybody else, hardly different at all. You know, it's, it's, wouldn't it be better to be a little bit Christian than to be not Christian at all? Wouldn't that be better? The answer is decidedly not. Because it gives very poor witness to Christianity. And some of our, for those of us who are true disciples, one of our biggest problems is fake Christians. But what if we have those in our church? They make Jesus sick to his stomach. How had they become lukewarm? Because all of us, we understand this, right? Any one of us can become lukewarm. It happens gradually. But what happens is we get caught up in the things of the world. We get more worried about our retirement than we are about the, the financial stability of the church. We get more concerned about living in a nice part of the town than being willing to live in a lousy part of town in order to convert people there. All right, we're relying on our fulfillment, our sense of arrival, our sense of, of entitlement from the world. We're self-sufficient Christians. And by the way, there is no such thing as a self-sufficient Christian. That's a lukewarm Christian. These people in Laodicea, they believed in the prosperity gospel, that God is there to make them wealthy and healthy and, and that kind of stuff. You know, if you say you're rich, you're poor. If you say you're poor, you're rich. Oh, oh wait, that sounds, that sounds like the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't it? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. I hope this isn't you. I've seen a lot of this in the churches. I've, I've gone to churches where I talk to somebody about how it's going. They talk about their house, and, you know, their job. And there's, by the way, there's nothing wrong with having a job and a nice house. But I would think they'd be talking about their ministry and, and their excitement over what God is using them to do in the church right now. All right. So who is wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked? You and me. That's who we're talking about, all of us. Now, praise the Lord, it was not too late for Laodicea. There was still time to repent. He says, come to me and get real gold, get things of real spiritual value, and start putting your treasures in heaven again. I'll take off those filthy materialistic clothes, and I'll put white clothes back on you. You can come back to relying on me instead of on the world for your satisfaction, for your sense of purpose. And I'll give you white clothes to cover your nakedness. And I'll put the real salve so you'll be able to see again. Not that salve that, that the doctors in Laodicea have. All right. Do you need to come for some eye salve to have some renewed vision for what it really means to be a disciple? If so, you know, all of these letters to the churches, if it applies to you for better or for worse, amen. It's time to do some evaluation. Maybe you've lost your first love. Maybe you've become tolerant of sin. Maybe you've uh, become lukewarm. But then again, maybe you've been really faithful and, and growing and, and opposing sin. Maybe you have. Amen. I hope that's the case. But you know what? When we're lukewarm, we keep Jesus as a, at a distance. And he says, I'm standing at the door and knocking. By the way, this passage here. In Revelation 3 is the most common passage used for the, uh, you know, pray Jesus into your heart doctrine. You probably are aware of that. Uh, but who's he talking to here? He's talking to Christians, right? He's talking to Christians. So this is not saying, you know, pray, open the door and I'm going to come in and say a prayer and say right away. Yippee skip one prayer you're saying. This is not a call to disciples to repent. Those who say they are rich, 
who are relying on themselves to begin relying on God again. Admit your wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, and buy gold from Jesus and I sat from Jesus. Accept God's rebuke. Amen? All right, so now, uh, by the way, just so you know, we've finished two classes, and the book of Revelation is about to start, because honestly and truly, the book of Revelation starts in chapter 4. I'm not kidding, folks. So we're about to really actually start the apocalyptic part of Revelation. Unfortunately, it is already uh, 9 o'clock. I went about five minutes longer than I should have probably. So uh, we need to uh, uh, call it quits. Uh, I, we may have time for question and answer. I'm not sure. But thanks for your attention. And I hand it back over to uh, Jesse or Jacob or whoever. I thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you so much uh, for that. I, I love this section of Revelation, obviously, and the rest of it, of course, but this in particular, because it's got so much uh, meat in that, so much information. So thank you. Thank you so much for really bringing forth the truth for us and educating us and so that we can go deep down the road. So we all applaud you for your effort and for your sincere heart and service for our region. Thank you for being part of that. So yes, at this time, we'll just take a very short session of Q&A because we've already gone beyond time. John had to do it today and, and that's okay, John. We need to do that. So amen. <laughs> I'm grateful that we could hear that. So if you have any specific questions at this time, I'd like to take it now and, uh, and then ask John if you have any and then conclude the prayer. So yes, anyone wants to go for I've not received any questions yet from anybody but there's one i would like to uh, ask which has been here is if someone has asked what would be the difference between tolerance and patience would you like to give a thought on that john the difference between tolerance and patience all right um i i think patience is uh more to do with a particular situation that presents itself right then and there. All right, so a uh, patience is a sort of a, a daily sort of emotional response to a situation. Tolerance has to do with the overall way you treat people. All right, so tolerance is a long-term situation. All right, uh, so um, for example, you could be tolerant but impatient. <laughs> All right. Because somebody does something that annoys you. And, and so tolerance has to do with uh, just an immediate emotion. Of, I'm sorry. Patience has to do with an immediate emotion of immediate situation. All right. Um, so if you're not tolerant of somebody, you will be impatient with them. I guarantee you. <laughs> uh, but you could be tolerant of somebody. You, you, like, for example, um, you, hmm. your, your children, you tolerate them. You love them totally but they can definitely get you impatient. Again, the question of tolerance, how does tolerance work for Christians? That's, that's an interesting topic because I think um, we want to be uh, tolerant of people of different faiths, of different backgrounds. We want to treat them with respect and love, but we don't want to tolerate sin in the church. Okay? Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense, John. Thank you. Uh, someone has asked, being cold or lukewarm, which is more dangerous? Well, I guess it doesn't really matter because we don't have cold disciples. We have lukewarm ones. Because if you're cold, you wouldn't even be here tonight. Now, if you're cold, we, there, we would not be having this conversation. I mean, I think you could argue that being cold is worse. I mean, you could make that argument clearly. Being lost is better than being lukewarm. But uh, in, in the context, Jesus is saying being lukewarm is worse than being cold. But, but he's saying that because of the situation. All right? right, Because he's more fearful of lukewarm Christians than people who are not even Christians. Lukewarm Christians uh, do more to destroy the church than non-Christians. So, I mean, it, it's... Yeah, take it with a grain of salt. 
you could you could definitely defend the idea that being lukewarm is not as bad as being cold because look, he offers them the opportunity to repent, right? <laughs> you know, but you know, it, it's like he's telling a parable. Don't push the details too much. So ask yourself, in what way is lukewarm worse than ice cold? Because you could defend either viewpoint, but just understand what he's trying to say. So he's saying in Christianity, the lukewarm, half-committed, half-hearted, hypocritical, supposed Christians do more to damage Christianity than the pagans and the Muslims and the Hindus and the, and the enemies of Christianity. So for the church, lukewarm is worse. Hmm. Yeah, it's a great challenge. Thank you. Thank you for presenting that. Uh, a quick one uh, was the issue of angels here in this passage or angel to which it has been addressed to. So what does it signify to the angel? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, yeah. Some people have used this to say that sort of every church has its own guardian angel over the church. Right. I wouldn't try to prove that using this passage. All right. Uh, obviously, we see angels in Revelation. The cherubim are angels. Seraphim are angels. Uh, I would say to the angel of the church in uh, Laodicea. It, it could refer even to the leaders of the church, possibly, to those, because angels are messengers, right? The word agaloi means yes. messenger, and malachim in Hebrew means messenger. So it could even refer to the uh, leaders or the, uh, it, scholars debate that. I don't have a, honestly, I don't have an answer for your question. I, I'm not sure what the correct answer is. So I don't think it's referring to like an individual guardian angel of an individual church. If that's, if that were true, then okay. Amen. It could be. It's true. I, I don't see biblical evidence for that. So I, I personally think he's talking to the leaders of the church. It's a strange way to say it, but I think that's what he's doing. Those who, who bring the message to the church, to the, to the evangelists or the, uh, the elders. Right. Um, I'll just take two more questions uh, to short of, short of time. I think one has been present, asked here is about the church in Pergamum and the issue of Satan's throne. Is there any right. issue on that issue? Why God or why Jesus called the church there Satan's throne? Is there anything no, the church is not Satan's throne. He's saying you live in a city which is Satan's throne. where Satan's throne is there. And again, Pergamum is a great center of pagan worship. It has these massive, massive temples, especially the one to Zeus. So they're living in a city which is saturated with pagan worship. All right, so they're living in a city where it's really, really tough to be a Christian. Maybe you could think of the equivalent somewhere in the Middle East, a place where it's just really, really tough to be a Christian. Maybe it would be in Riyadh or something like that. I, I really, you have to decide for yourself. All right. So, uh, and by the way, scholars believe he's probably referring to an actual specific place. And I showed you the picture. It's that, it's that temple to Zeus. Uh, mm. This, if you're there, if you're in the city, the city is, is below and up on top on the Acropolis there is this massive uh, um temple to Zeus as kind of symbolic just you know the pagan gods rule over this city and I'm sure that people felt that so he gave that as kind of a reassurance you know I know it's tough over there okay yeah thank you one last thing uh, pertaining to uh, tolerance and patience and that issue about how does the church deal with uh, political correctness and issues of gender or race or color and things like that. And when these things come into the church, how, how can that be handled? I, I'm not sure I understand the question, to be honest with you. Uh, I would say, uh, I think we as disciples need to choose our words carefully. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I know right-wing politically conservative people get really impatient with political correctness, and I get that. 
But I, I think that uh, probably we need to speak cautiously. And, and we, as Christians, we need to, uh, you know, not use offensive language. I, I think generally we probably need to most of the time follow along with politically correct language uh, out of a desire to not offend people. I, I'm not sure if that's where the question's coming from. I, uh, political correctness generally is an issue for people outside the church more than people in the church. So um, uh, in America, uh, a lot of people just get very impatient with political correctness. But to me, political correctness means being sensitive to not offending people. And what's so bad about that? All right. But I, I, I see this as not primarily an issue of the church to worry about. I would just say, hey, we need to be considerate of everybody. And if, if a language is offensive to somebody, I'd say, let's find a different way to say it. I know people use offensive language to get people's attention, right? I, I get it. Well, let's find a different way to get their attention than to say something offensive. Let's just tell them the truth. So, um, yeah, I, I, in America, this is part of the whole political thing, you know, and generally right-wing conservative people uh, get very angry about political correctness. But I say, too bad for you. I mean, that, that just means that you're, an insensitive person. You probably need to stop being that way. Uh, but not that I'm a real left-wing progressive person necessarily. Uh, but I, that's probably not a very good question. I'm, I'm not sure that's even what he was asking. That's my best take on it. Right, right. So thank you. Thank you for answering it. I, I'm not sure I understood it fully as well. This is what I got it from the question. But I think for today, time is uh, really yeah. short and uh, we need have to call it off now and probably take up some questions next time if possible. Uh, yes. Thank you so much, John, patiently answering and thank you to everyone.